Hi guys, uh, for those I have not met yet, I'm uh, David Ishmael, I'm the Vice President for the IT Operations and Analytics team at uh, Trace3. Uh, before we start this uh, breakout, I just wanted to take a second to kind of give a, a little bit of an intro to, uh, to Don Burroughs. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody has been attending the, uh, the keynote speeches this morning, all about AI, machine learning. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to do was dive a little bit deeper into more than just strategy and theory, right? Uh, kind of like what Mark Campbell did this morning, you know, really showing what can come out of some of these advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the, uh, the challenge that I gave to Don was, you know, look at, the, look at what you're doing out in, the, uh, out in your customer spaces, identify a problem, define that problem space, and then apply machine learning to, to fix that problem. And then really walk through how you applied that machine learning model to solve that problem, and then give you guys kind of an inside look at how that process looks. So with that, I'll give, uh, give the floor to my favorite uh, mathematician here, Don Burroughs. All right. All right. Check, good. Okay, so uh, I saw this and I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, it kind of just combines data, features, and algorithms in a Venn diagram, and it kind of puts it all together, all together. That's kind of gives a good overview of machine learning. So uh, I thought this picture was pretty cool, so I put it at the beginning of my presentation. <laughs> uh -oh. There we go. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from the University of Houston Clear Lake. I graduated 2015. Uh, straight out of college, I st started working in security. Um, and I immediately found a strange attraction to machine learning. Um, I know that's kind of weird wording, but that was kind of a tip of the hat to anyone that's taken a chaos theory course before. Uh, strange attractor. Uh, I'm not a data scientist, um, but I do plan on eventually <coughs> applying to the University of Washington's data science master's program. Okay, so uh, again, we're going to talk a little bit about machine learning. Um, so machine learning is an AI discipline that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, it finds structures and patterns. Uh, in the actual data itself, the data set. Um, and they can actually, once they are trained, they can predict an outcome of a novelty event that's never been seen before <clears throat> with supervised learning. So uh, there's a couple different kinds. There's the two main are supervised and unsupervised learning. You use supervised whenever you have labels with your data. Um, and then you use those to actually uh, train your model. Um, if you don't have labels, you typically would go more of the cluster route, which is unsupervised learning. Um, so that way, events that are more similar get clustered together, and events that are not similar are typically in different clusters, right? And then there's neural networks. Uh, it's just a set of algorithms modeled loosely after the human brain. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about, oops, sorry, domain generating algorithms. So these are techniques used by malware that uh, kind of, they try to avoid blacklisting, basically. They, uh, the, uh, the infected host will create all these randomized uh, queries to the DNS, <coughs> but only a few of them typically actually calls out to the command and control server. As you can see, most of them return an X domain. So the malware is constantly creating new domain, randomized domains. And on the, this side, they go and register a couple of these like pretty quickly and then take it offline within 24 hours. So it's very hard to block these. Um, so that's where machine learning comes in for these. Um, we actually will break down these queries, uh, do some feature engineering, and then uh, train some models on that based on some test data sets. 
Um, there's another one I wanted to talk a little bit about is DNS tunneling. Um, so this is actually using DNS to get <coughs> info from the infected host. It's encoded in the subdomain, sent back to this authoritative DNS server that is uh, owned by this uh, <coughs> malicious bot right here. <coughs> or I guess a command and control server, right? So uh, yeah, it, as you can see, it's encoded subdomain right here, this infected host credential. So this is data that's being exfiltrated from this infected host. It goes to the recursive DNS server. Um, it's not in cache, so it gets sent out to the authoritative DNS server, which is owned by this guy. And this guy takes this encoded uh, data right here and will actually decrypt it, and he now has your credential. So that's a good thing to detect too. Uh, so why machine learning? Um, DNS is a very large, it has vast amounts of data. Um, so attackers like to hide in it basically to help evade detections. Uh, so DGAs can generate high numbers of non-existent domains. Talked about that a little bit. Large amounts of training data is available because of all those uh, domains they're generating. So that, and then uh, we have, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Oops. So uh, DGA malware uses techniques to avoid detection. Old signature base and blacklisting methods are not effective in stopping DGA. So machine learning takes a learning approach using a training data set of known legit domains and known DGA domains. Um, Unsupervised machine learning models can be used for this as well. And even if we do have labels, you can still do unsupervised learning. Um, you can use those labels for any kind of external evaluation. Afterwards, see how well the labels describe the clusters that you have created or the model has created. <coughs> okay, so uh, we just need to gather data is a very big part. And, uh, machine learning. So there is legit domains, and these are just a couple examples where you can get them. So these have million data points, which is a lot. And then DGA feeds has so many. So you have no problem in fi not finding enough data for this. Um, it is very important for classification tasks, which this is, to uh, only use a training data set when you're training your model and you want to hold out some of that data for testing afterwards. You don't want to test on data that you trained on, basically. That's a big one. You can also use cross-validation, which is kind of similar to this, but it's iteratively uses one of these blocks as the test, and then the other blocks are used to train. So it does that once and gets the uh, score, moves on to the next block, and uses that as testing. All the other blocks are now trained, so it runs this quite a few times, and then it'll take the average of all those scores and return it, so you kind of know how well that model is predicting, all right? It is, in a classification tasks, it's also very important to um, try to get balanced uh, classes. So you want about an equal number of legit domains, equal number of DGA domains for training, right? Okay, so now let's uh, extract some features. <laughs> TFIDF, it stands for oh, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. So, uh, I don't know if I should dive into this or not. <laughs> um, so F is a function of frequency, so it, how many times that's showing up in that specific event. Uh, T is for token, so that's uh, the actual, in our case, right now, you, you typically you would do words as your token for sentences and things, but since we're doing domains, I'm doing character analysis. So the token is gonna be individual characters in the domain. So we're looking for TF, that's just this portion right here, is the frequency that token T is showing up in document D, little d. So that's just 
one document out of the entire corpus, which is uh, the big D, all right? So that's all the domains in the data set is big D, and little d is a single one out of that data set that we're looking at. Now max, w, n, d, w is just the word that occurs most in that specific document. So the frequency of word is in the denominator of tf, and that particular uh, character we're on right now gets put in the numerator. So that's term frequency, that's just a way to see um, how many times that character is showing up in that specific event. Now inverse document frequency, we're looking at the entire data set and applying it. So uh, these bars right here, uh, next to the big D, that is called cardinality. That's just saying how many data, uh, how many events do we have in our data set. Uh, now divided by uh, little d inside of big D, so that's, this is for all the uh, events in the corpus that have a token inside, uh, this T token inside of it. So that's kind of looking, this T token right here, how many times that shows up inside of the entire data set. So when you combine those two things together, they give you a pretty good, they print out a numeric uh, vector that a machine learning model can actually uh, use. Uh, this is kind of given the overview of how this n-gram character analysis works. Think of it as a sliding window. Uh, so bigrams just two, uh, yeah, two, trigrams three, but this can be scaled out to however many, that's why it's called n-gram. That n can be any number. Um, so in this example right here, I did uh, trigram. So as you can see, it's just kind of sliding down. So these are all remembered by the TF-IDF algorithm and it built a dictionary for each in, uh, unique trigram. And then um, for each uh, event or domain, it's gonna build out a, a numeric vector based off of all of these unique trigrams that found in the entire corpus. So um, yeah, a numeric vector is built using the frequency of occurrence of each unique ingram in both a single domain and across all domains in aggregate. This is called term frequency inverse document frequency. Okay, principal component analysis. So term frequency uh, inverse document frequency can produce a whole lot of features. And if you are plugging too many features into a machine learning model, that can really be expensive. So um, it's not uncommon to uh, try to reduce dimensionality. So that's what I did here. Um, it's called principal component analysis. This is basically, it's linear algebra. It's, take, it's finding the eigenvalues of the matrix of the whole data set of the TF-IDF. <clears throat> and then it's uh, sorting it. it. And then it spits out the eigenvectors based off those eigenvalues and sorts them small, uh, largest to smallest. And then from there, so it's still exactly the same size, but from there you can choose how many of the uh, features you wanna keep because since it's sorted from largest to smallest, all the variance is in the uh, higher order uh, columns. So I chose three for this case. Most of the variance was in there. So I just stuck with these. Now we only have to deal with three features uh, for the machine learning model. So I went ahead and uh, trained a couple classifiers uh, based off just these uh, three features, the principal components. And you can see uh, this is a gradient boost classifier. Gradient boosting uh, scored the best. So the precision was about 86%. Not horrible, but not great either. Um, a random forest, about 86% also. Uh, SVM is a su support vector machine, uh, about 84%. So they're all in the mid 80s or so. Uh, LR is logistic regression. <clears throat> and the uh, GMB is Gaussian, Gaussian naive Bayesian. Uh, that performed the worst. So I was not satisfied with these scores, so I kept working at the feature engineering. 
so what I did now, I started breaking up the domain into its separate parts. Uh, so I gave a couple examples right here. This is the full query I was dealing with. Uh, so I broke it up into subdomain and domain. From here, I did all of this stuff. Uh, oh, I thought this. <laughs> so um, a ratio. That's not. So instead of a, I meant to have a set down here. I guess I accidentally removed it. But a is supposed to be vowel, consonant, digit, and dash. So it's seeing how many times a vowel shows up in the domain, and divides it by the entire length of the do domain. And it does the same thing with vowels and then uh, numbers or digits, right? So uh, regular English or normal domains typically will follow kind of a pattern of the English language of a similar vowel ratio, consonant ratio, and that sort of thing. Uh, but DGA, those are going to stray quite far from that typically. So that's what this stuff is up here. Entropy, just think of that as string randomness in this case. Uh, so we're, yeah, that's just a good way to uh, uh, say how frequently something's showing up. The more unique characters in it, the higher the entropy's gonna be. Uh, last one is meaning. This is looking, it's using an English dictionary to look through the domain and pick out how many English words it actually found in that domain. So uh, it's the sum of the length of the word found in the domain. So it can find multiple words. The, the summation of all the lengths of the words are in the numerator and then divided by the total length of the domain. And that gives us a meaning ratio. So these are applied to both domain and subdomain. And at this point, I have a lot more features uh, to work with, so I do a little bit of exploratory analysis. This is the original PCA, principal component features I extracted in a uh, scatter plot matrix. So you can see there is some separability. It's not great, but there's some. Um, this up here is a correlation matrix on a heat map. This tells you how correlated each feature is with the other feature. So pure white means it's completely correlated, uh, and black is completely negatively correlated. We don't want features that are too correlated together because we don't gain much information from that. Um, now this is just a box plot um, of the domain Shannon entropy. Uh, so, and the data sets I had actually had the malware that was producing the, the DGAs. So I laid it out that way. You can see Corbot has almost no variance, which is interesting. Um, and one of these in here with the highest variance, I think is the legit domain. It's hard to read, but right there. It's legit, look how bit wide that is. So it kind of spans throughout the whole thing. So after I extracted these features, take a look at the scores now. The precision is around 94% for both uh, the gradient boosting classifier and the random forest classifier. 92% uh, for the support vector machine. Uh, 89, about 90% for logistic regression. And then the uh, the Gaussian naive Bayesian still not performing very well. So comparing that to just the principal components, to all the features extracted, there is a pretty good improvement. Uh, I would say 94 is pretty, pretty good. Uh, yeah. This isn't what you're supposed to do. Okay, so from here I was analyzing the false positives and the false negatives, uh, just to see what those look like. Um, this. Right here is called a confusion matrix. 
Um, and it's, it's actually called a confusion matrix. Uh, so out of all the counts of everything, everything gets classified as either being a true positive, a true negative, a false positive, or a false negative. So you count up each one and put them in this matrix, and it gives you a good overview of how well your model's performing, and you can use these equations right here uh, to figure out recall and precision. So 94.3% is the recall. It's about equal and precision. Okay, misclassifications. Um, so if you take a look at the false and negative examples, a lot of these have actual English words in them, but they were classified as being DGA. These are actually, they actually are DGA. They're just using a more uh, advanced approach to creating their algorithm by using an English dictionary, right? So, uh, yeah, many false negatives are from malware that uses concatenated random words from a dictionary to create the domain. This is a more advanced method to help evade detection from uh, NLP derived ML models. So now the false positives, those look pretty funky still, I would say. Um, so it's easy to see why these models will be classified uh, false positives, or why the model will classify the false positives as being DGA. It's a, a possible misclassification in the training data, data set. But uh, if I saw these in production, I would still go take a look at that. So further development in this area, um, I wanted to start jumping into deep learning, or just neural networks in general, um, because there have been significant improvements in the feature extraction. It's getting to the point where it's almost automated. So you don't need to sit down and do all that if you know how to uh, do neural networks. So advances in deep learning are removing the need for the data science to perform feature engineering and performing just as well or better. All right, conclusion. Uh, DNS is a common vector used by threat actors due to its prevalence and lack of monitoring. Uh, it's relatively easy for an infected host to connect to the malicious uh, command and control server using DNS with a common seed between the infected host and the command and control server. Uh, the randomly generated domains are used to avoid blacklisting, so old methods of detection are no longer suffice. So the introduction of machine learning to security and ITOA helps resolve this issue in near real time. Uh, so further development to this problem are to incorpor incorporate uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, deep learning, and then uh, for automated feature extraction. And that's what I got. <laughs> questions. So I guess I will open it up for questions. Any questions? So I got a question for you, Don. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I mean, I think this is great, and I think uh, hopefully everybody in here gets a sense of how machine learning can be applied. Maybe, maybe this is useful in your environment, but maybe it's not. Um, so Don, could you apply something like this to insider threat? Let's say I had access to email content. Could I apply this to understand intent within my organization? Uh, you're talking about in the actual email itself? Uh, yeah, you can definitely use TFIDF to uh, find a, what's that called, latent, uh, it, it can be applied, it, you use a TF-IDF method with uh, words instead of characters, and it will look at the actual words inside of the email and see if it's associated with bad or what is normally in a malicious email compared to a legit email. So I would probably go that route, just off the top of my head. Uh, but yes, it can absolutely be uh, used. Uh, I would have to noodle on that for a minute. Prism, Prism did something like that. You can use dirty words, and you can also use contextual words, things that happen close together, like using bomb five words away from president, right? 
So I think uh, there's ways to, to apply this kind of concept. I think what you have to do is you have to start thinking creatively. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. Awesome. Thanks, Don. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Right. <laughs>